hello, everybody, one and all. Welcome to another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles. I am your co-host. And with me, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well. Today, we begin a very exciting uh, new series, new author, new everything. Uh, We are beginning the Book of the Ancestor trilogy, starting with none other than Red Sister by Mark Lawrence. Nailed it, Charles. I'm pumped to get into this one. This is the result of a rousing... (laughs) <laughs> a space rousing Thank game you. of friends pitching fantasy that we were uh, we had a little while back and i pitched this to you you selected mm-hmm. it and here we are we're gonna that's cover it. right dylan you'd read this a while back so this is your second read through mm-hmm. this is my first read through i've read I've read one trilogy by Mark Lawrence. Uh, which one is that? Where it's like Prince of Thorns, Emperor of Thorns. Yeah, that's the Broken Empire. Yeah, uh, Broken Empire. So I read Broken Empire trilogy. I thought it was great, which was a big part of why I chose Book of the Ancestor in uh, the Friends Pitching Fantasy episode. And I'm glad I did because it was really entertaining. And 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 no one writes fantasy like Mark Lawrence. Tell me more about what you mean by that, Charles. No one writes fantasy like Mark Lawrence? (laughs) Yeah, I just find his style to be very interesting and unique. First of all, Mark Lawrence, for those of you that don't know, his background is rather interesting. He's got like a PhD in math or something like that. He's like a full-on scientist. and He was a former rocket scientist. Yeah, former rocket scientist, worked he on the... currently is a former rocket scientist. Yeah. <laughs> so he was a former rocket scientist. <laughs> he... <laughs> well, he is a former rocket scientist. Yes. He was formerly a scientist, and he worked on, like, the Star Wars project and all that. So um, his approach to fantasy has almost like a very sci-fi kind of aspect to it he really gets into the nitty-gritty of in in this case there's a school and a magic system and you know his settings as well are always rather complex Uh, this one we're in like a frozen wasteland but there's a sun that goes through this magnifying glass that heats up the a sliver of corridor yeah. super interesting i'm like man no one writes uh, it, it takes someone with a lifetime of math and science experience who then decides to write best-selling fantasy you know there's only one person like that that i know of and that's mark lawrence so it's really interesting stuff to kind of go through this book and be reminded of the unique setting that was in um uh, the broken empire as well so yeah just Happy to be back in the mind of Mark Lawrence. Yeah, that's so well said, Charles. It is very interesting that Mark Lawrence decided to write stuff that's primarily classified as fantasy, though it obviously has those sci-fi elements. It, it always seems to. And right. the yeah, the choice is really interesting because you would think that someone with his background would be a natural fit for hard science fiction exactly that really gets into all the details of all that yeah but instead he gives us just enough of that science fiction background to create some really interesting scenarios like the ticking time bomb that is a dying sun right. uh, that uh, just lights up the uh, cor- corridor through the the moon which is really a, a magnifying glass sort of thing that they'd send into right. space i guess it's, um, it's vaguely described yeah so the whole thing there mark gives us what we need he doesn't though he i'm a hundred percent sure has all the knowledge to really dive into all of that he never really makes the story about that and i really appreciate that as more of a, exactly. a fantasy character focused reader who would rather see what mark lawrence actually does do which is give a lot of attention to these characters and he fleshes them out with so much depth exactly i think one of the things if i ever got the opportunity to ask mark lawrence a question like one of the things i would love to know is why why fantasy and why not Mm -hmm. like why go into these swords and sorcery things like i'm sure that he draws on something he just that makes him like sword and sorcery and 
and he brings science fiction in and like what makes it a fantasy book and not a science fiction book like it's very interesting how he draws these lines you know and like have how all of his characters don't know anything about science but they just happen to live in an environment heavily influenced by science fiction so you see it through this fantasy lens of like what if these characters were born into this world where someone had apparently launched spaceships and built a magnifying glass to keep the planet warm and and lost all the technology and now these people are in this uh like medieval like fantasy world trying to survive and they don't understand the technology so super interesting environments that he puts his characters in and that's kind of how this book is is introduced right this cool uh this cool setting that blends sci-fi and fantasy in such a unique way it definitely does charles well shall we get into more of the spoiler portion of our buddy (laughs) read episode here and let's do it just dive into all the plot points so a good time to tap out now if (laughs) if you you haven't haven't read this book (laughs) because we're gonna talk about all of it so oh also yeah story we fleshed out the saying there it we should also mention nona Uh, the story (laughs) mostly follows nona as she is trained to be a killer nun at sweet mercy convent that's pretty much what this story is about it's got some revenge elements and whatnot but we'll get into the deets of all of that Mm -hmm. so charles i i was figuring we could just vaguely follow the plot of this (laughs) book while mentioning whatever things we think are worth discussing as they come up uh we'll we'll play it fast and loose as we always do (laughs) on the fdf podcast (laughs) but how's that sound that sounds good to me why don't you start us off with our first plot point here sure well it starts with the interlude and it has an opening line that uh, (laughs) i know i posted as one of our first ever reddit posts our comments that was in response to a post that asked about favorite opening lines and i think people tend to use this one all the time Mm -hmm. (laughs) when they're describing their favorite opening lines it's uh, it is important when killing a nun to ensure that you bring an army of sufficient size for sister thorn of the sweet mercy convent lano tactus brought 200 men I mean, how could you not, when talking about this book, bring up that first line? You know, it's <laughs> right away. You're like, "What? You're bringing 200 men to kill a nun?" And it's like it's epicness around the way he phrased it, and brilliant. And I know, like, we've had conversations about first lines before, and even before that, write a post. You've gone to that opening a bunch of times. That and and um the magician's opening line but this one for sure is been a go-to and i finally get to contextualize it and i agree it's a really terrific way to kind of introduce the story yeah i i'm glad to hear that it holds up i do find most people even after reading the story they're like yeah that pretty much sets the stage (laughs) like every goodreads review includes it as well you know it's like it's hard to avoid it i mean it's such a strong opening (laughs) So it's it starts high, and I think it keeps that momentum. And we pretty these interludes. I know you, Charles, don't usually love when Mark Lawrence's work gets timey wimey. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, did you find these aspects more palatable? In right. Red Sister. So when we read, Broken like Empire? we had read Broken Empire years ago before. F- friends talking fantasy right so we had these conversations in private about my kind of confusion gripes with the back and forth like time jump structure of broken empire so when we went into friends pitching fantasy and you gave your pitch my very first question was look is this one of those things where we're going to be going back and forth in time and you're like yes but uh i think you'll like it so I was I trusted your judgment on that one. And I have to say that I think we get like three different flashback kind of moments throughout the book, um, like the or flash forwards, I should say, in the beginning, the middle and the end. Yeah. And I thought they were great because I think Mark Lawrence did something clever with this one. He, you know, changed the characters names. He worked in this element of like, oh, um, 
nuns get new names when they're older which so you get these characters come in you don't know who sister thorn is and you kind of forget yeah. about her and then it's not till like the middle of the book when um when you it it's revealed that um what's her name it's like uh, ala ara ara that ara arabella is, arabella arabella <laughs> is revealed to name herself um sister thorn so i liked that and then as you went into these other flash forwards you could see that there was this kind of falling out with yeah. all of the um with all of the sisters and not every sister was introduced right in the middle one you just know it's the first name starts with a c and i already kind of had my we'll suspicions on that yeah. one and we'll get there and then the last one it introduced like maybe one other so you didn't it didn't give away anything about the plot right with broken empire it was like the same the main character was in the flash forwards so you're like when he's in these high stakes situations you're like it's not like he's you know not gonna be you know so i had like those issues with with broken empire but those issues totally gone with these and i'm what's good about these is i'm super interested in reading the next book to figure out how all this falling out happened and who's on what side and i'm just really interested in the relationships now so if anything it's yes. a great service to the plot so I, I think mark lawrence really came into his own with this one and vastly improved upon that use of flash forward from broken empire to now you make a great point about the relationships here i think that's what's at the core of this book is mm -hmm. the relationships between these at this point novices uh, at least when we're not in the flash forwards, they're novices, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to Nona, Clara, and Ara. Mm -hmm. I think that's the heart of this book, the ship heart, if you will. Ooh. So, hey, <laughs> hey, oh. So, uh, speaking <laughs> of relationships, one of Nona's first friendships is with a child named Sida. And something else I think that Mark Lawrence does brilliantly here is he starts you in the point of view, not of Nona, who will be following for the vast majority of the remainder of this book, but with the point of view of Sida. Mm -hmm. And Sida is a child in this uh, uh, cultus, uh, and somehow she's gotten herself in the situation where she's on death row. And the line that it starts with is, no child truly believes they will be hanged. And yeah. that Sida thinking, oh, I knew the whole time this abbess is coming now. So she sees abbess class and she's thinking, I'm going to get saved. I knew it. I knew this wouldn't happen yeah. to me. And it's so brilliantly done because <laughs> yeah. uh, you know that Mark Lawrence later on, you get to figure out is basically having his main character, Nona, be saved from death row. Mm-hmm. So uh, that feels almost a little tropey. We've seen these kind of things before, and it, like plot armory, right? right. And, uh, okay, of course the main character gets saved at the before they get hanged, but instead he gives us the point of view of Sida, who's this other child, and it's <laughs> like he reminds you, hey, children do get hanged in this world. It is that brutal. It is that messed up. And I'm gonna start you in her point of view, so you empathize with her. And think, oh, that's well, not really going to happen. And then it does. She yeah. does get hanged. It, he's, Lawrence is definitely keeping us on our toes, like right out of the gate. Like already we've had a jump in time. We've had totally new characters introduced twice. And now who we believe to be is the main character, who is a child, um, ends up getting hanged even with the setup of oh this this nun is coming to save me so right in the first couple pages you're like whoa lawrence is throwing a lot at me right now and if you're someone you know like me who's like hungry to just dive into some fantasy i was like man this is going everywhere you know i was really up for it and um that whole play on our expectations of okay this is the main character here's how we're kicking it off like getting saved from the hallows kind of a thing but no and that's just uh me being like okay i'm i'm <laughs> i'm reading this with an open mind now let's see where this goes <laughs> and i always pronounced it as sadia but uh i'll, I'll defer to your pronunciation of, of sida <laughs> yeah. like sada or sadia 
Well, I pulled my typical at this point, splitting time between the audiobook and the, oh, <laughs> the audiobook actually here. So I have the paperback and I actually had the audiobook from the first time I uh, read, but at that point, mostly listened. Um, so this time I would say I mostly read, but I also listened. And it is Sida, according to the audio. Okay, Sida. So, That's good to know. Yeah. And anyway, Sida unfortunately goes down and she's known as friend and as we learned throughout this book friendship means a lot to nona the word friend once it's been once it's been uttered to nona that comes with all sorts of connotations mm -hmm. yeah and this is something about her character that i would maybe have wanted to see more fleshed out like i like that it's that part of her but i guess i never really understood why she's so young she's had I, I guess like okay she's had one friend i suppose and it's this older juggler guy and and now she's like all in on friendship you know i i think there was a for how much like development and fleshing out we get of the magic system and the school and everything i i kind of felt like i i could have used a little more uh development and why she feels that way you know that's interesting, Charles. I've always thought this was really well done. I So Nona is maybe eight or nine by the time. She actually doesn't know her age by the time that right. she is sold to Giljan, uh, who's the person who puts her and others in a cage to sell them off to, right. <laughs> to the, the academy. Yeah, to, like the yeah. child gatherer or something. Yeah. Uh, so, and... It's maybe not delved into in depth, but it is clearly stated that she basically went those first eight years or whatever without having any friends and being an outcast in the village. And I mean, I would think that eight years of complete outcast dumb, though that's not a word, yeah. and being alienated maybe if we spent more time actually seeing it, Charles, you mm -hmm. would have bought into that a little bit more. Uh, I found it like, okay, if you're telling I me, believe, I was cool yeah. with it, but I was also like, you know, she's so adamant about it. And I thought maybe one of these reveals was going to show us why. And, it, mm. and while I did, I'm still on board with it. I was just like, okay, this is one of those things that I'm just going to have to accept. And she's eight years old too. So, so young to, I like, and I get that people grow fast in these kinds of <laughs> environments, but I was also like, she's very much bought into this and, and, and held on to it her whole life. So, um, very interesting. Yeah. Well, I think that's, uh, yeah, interesting. I think agree <laughs> to disagree on that yeah. one as we'll keep rolling. <laughs> <Yeah>. The <laughs> minor thing. I'm all on board yeah. with Nona. <laughs> <laughs> so then. We have Abbas Glass who saves Nona, and this is where things do start to get a little timey wimey again, Charles. And I thought maybe you'd have some issues with this, but it sounds like you, you didn't. We get some flashbacks as she's getting taken to Sweet Mercy Convent, which is kind of, oh, here's how I spent this time in Gil John's cage. Here's how right. I spent time in the cultus, and here's how I almost killed Ramel Taxis, which is what got her on death row in the first place. So, any, any thoughts on that? I was that fine with it. It was the it's the flash forwards that I usually have like the framing story taking place in the future is like the main issue. So like starting off somewhere super interesting and then just going a little bit further back to contextualize it and get us back to where we are. I'm fine with that. And again, this is like the the second time skip we've had from Lawrence in the first handful of pages so I would definitely not <laughs> recommend Lawrence to first time fantasy readers but for those veterans it's so good it just, it just keeps you on your toes keeps you fresh it keeps the story uh, going <laughs> yeah and then once I get to red class over at Sweet Mercy Convent mm. we don't really get a ton of flashbacks we, anymore we do get no, like we don't Nona tells the story of the juggler and how she ended up getting sold basically three separate times and each time adding more truth to it until the third time it is the the truth. Right. Um, but in a almost 500-page book, 
maybe the latter hundred or sorry maybe the latter 350 pages of it there's only like a couple flashbacks from there so right let's get to sweet mercy then let's and do talk it. about red class where nona's pretty quickly introduced to clara who kind of takes the role we've seen a lot of these school stories right king killer harry potter whatever so right. oh, we're used to this kind of setting good old and, school setting <laughs> yeah and we're pretty quickly introduced to clara who takes the place of the almost what we would think like a ron hermione type close friend or maybe uh a sim or a will from King Killer or whatever, right? right? Right, This is the person who, for whatever reason, has taken a quick liking to our protagonist, also is not the spoiled rich kid or anything, and is kind of showing them the ropes and taking them around. Right. Um, she was a family of a wealthy merchant that is in financial trouble, right? Yes. So she is also kind of poor, which fits along the lines of that humble sidekick friend person, like a Ron Weasley type. Yes. So then that is contrasted by Ara, uh, Arabella, who is Arabella Jotsis. And the sis, that, those last three letters of uh, the last names of these noble characters, basically, it, that's going to be there every time you see one of these noble characters. So they'll hmm. call them the sis. So that's Jotsis. There was Raymal Taxis, who's the person that Nona almost killed, who's a, a ring fighter and son of a very, very powerful noble. So whenever you see sis in this book, you know it's one of those noble, wealthy folks. And Ara seems to be slotting in early on to that almost Draco Malfoy. Exactly, yeah. Or that uh, um, Ambrose from the King Killer Chronicle. Exactly. The wealthy person. The rival. Who is the rival who is uh, mean-spirited and all this kind of stuff. And I think we do end up finding out along the way that both Clara and Ara have a lot more depth than that typical than those typical tropes that's true i i find it kind of funny that this book is all about the school setting because i remember we were when we were preparing for king killer chronicles and we read mark lawrence's review on goodreads do you remember this and he was like man that school setting is really popular these yes. days and then the next series he writes what is it but this <laughs> you know so <laughs> i think you know he was definitely scouting out what was popular in modern fantasy and decided he was going to play upon this school trope. So going into it, it is kind of interesting how he you know, sets up your expectations for character and dynamics and things. And we readily kind of fall into it. Um, but he does do a good job of swaying us. And it's this trio, this connection that really drives the whole book. I find their relationship, their like triangle relationship to be super interesting. There's all these moments where Clara like has this kind of love fatuation with um with Nona and Nona's like not kind of reciprocating and she's like kind of choosing between the two and Clara's trying to just cling on to her. So that dynamic is super interesting and in the the context of how it was set up of this, these school setting tropes of like, oh, she's supposed to be the rival. Why do you yeah. all of a sudden like her so much? It, it is super interesting and unique. Yeah. And we go maybe half the book before where Ara very much seems to be in that role. Yeah. The There's this thing way... with like the knife in the bed yes. and all this. And Nona's convinced that Ara's like talking behind her back, making jokes because she's still insecure about being like a a nobody that came in on like a you know a, a child gatherer's cart or something like that yeah. so um so yeah she's totally bought into it for a good half the book yeah and i think that while ara does come in maybe a little spoiled but not anything outside of what you'd expect for someone with her background right uh, and it would always be no no walks into a room and hears the end yeah. of a sentence and she takes it as she was just joking about her before she came in yeah so you get those moments um they can pee a little bit 
you know, there's the sword and the, the knife and the dagger in the bed situation. Yes. Yeah. So. so, yeah. So it, there's this moment where it seems like maybe Ara threatened Nona or tried to stab Nona and there's a dagger in her pillow oh, and Nona wakes up to it, but she's not really sure what happened. And because we, I think, I think this is what Mark Lawrence does this whole time with Ara is uh, we know to slot Ara into this Ambrose or Draco Malfoy role. So we're right there with Nona of making all these assumptions about what Ara is or isn't doing so we kind of don't give her the charity principle here right and assume, exactly like r is doing all these bad things but we do find out later on that like Ara didn't do that yeah. it was the noi guin uh, and <laughs> then when nona reflects on ara's uh, the reasons why she didn't like Ara, there's this great quote, which is, Ara's crimes appeared to be confined confined to being beautiful, being born rich, and being the chosen one. Everything else, <laughs> Nona realized, was something given to her by Clara or something assumed. She had assumed that the remainder of half her jokes were at her expense, that the laughter that faded as she entered the room had been at her. And that gets at exactly what you were talking about, exactly. Charles. Like, when you, as the reader, reflect on what did Ara do wrong, once you know Know that the um, <laughs> that the knife thing was a misunderstanding, especially you're like, oh wait, Ara's not so bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This use of these classism tropes and these school tropes came blended together beautifully for the development of this Nona Ara relationship at the school. So uh, super interesting. For sure. And in fact, from Ara's perspective, their like first day, I think it is. It seems like. Nona purposefully stole Ara's belt. Uh, yes. That, that was also a misunderstanding. And then Nona, I mean, Ara has to get her head shaved and she's yeah. got like these long golden locks. Yeah. People say she looks like a princess. So that's really rough for Ara to go through. Yeah. And then when it turns out the knife thing was misunderstanding too, it's like, which she didn't actually try to exact revenge upon that. Uh, yeah. of, she didn't have revenge because of that. So it's like... Right. <laughs> yeah what did our so i i think i wrote somewhere uh in our notes hashtag ara did nothing wrong yeah, <laughs> yeah ara did nothing wrong free ara people <laughs> yeah so all right well we talked through a lot of what happens here during red class just through all of that and uh we did not mention though that the other taxis shows up and Nona basically attacks, attacks, I think that's Lano, Taxis. Mm -hmm. And then all of this starts to culminate in a trial and they put Nona and Abbas Glass on trial, basically. They're going oh, yes, to get put to, yeah, they're going to get put to death if for it, this whole taxes stuff where yeah basically the, the idea of the abbas taking away mm -hmm. their prisoner and holding yeah. and holding her uh makes her guilty and then the prisoner who is known as still has to get killed so the the church is out for blood for both of them mm -hmm. and that's led by that high priest at that time mm -hmm. who seems to really dislike abbas glass and seems to want to get her done away with the abbas then uses some old I don't know how old <laughs> rule I guess yeah, some of law. the church yeah. yeah, where she's able to try to prove she's telling the truth by putting her hand to the flame <laughs> and she uses some of these tricks that they learn about clarity and stuff serenity. to be able to serenity and she's able to basically just watch her hand burn and by the way, all the other higher ups in the church were trying to were on the abbess's side, so it left this one high priest to just be the reason why Abbas Glass was burning her hand to a crisp. Right. Nona. So during that, the line is dropped that Nona is supposed to be the shield based on some prophecy, right. and Ara is supposed to be the chosen one in this prophecy. And there's something that the shield can do or someone who's claimed to be the shield to prove that they are the shield. It's the ordeal. 
And Nona says she'll do it because she doesn't want to watch Abbas Glass burn her hand anymore. Yeah, because it goes into um, some intense detail and Glass is really suffering and everyone's kind of getting queasy watching it. And Mm -hmm. uh, so Nona does step in. This whole idea of Nona... She was kind of conflicted at the time, but she was, she comes back to that thing of like, you know, she did save me and she is nice to me. I would probably consider her a friend. I'll do the trial, whatever. So um, that gets us to the second uh, um, like trial within this trial, you know, so we're, we're, we're moving along. Yep. And Nona has to basically go through three rounds of protecting another novice. This is Hessa in this case, Mm -hmm. who's also from Giljon's cage and shows magical abilities of a Quantal. Mm -hmm. They're the four different, uh, like, what do they call Do they call them races in this? Um, It's always referred to as race and blood. Also, you 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 show the blood in you if you do. Um, Yeah. So... Yeah, so there's Hanska, Gerant. Uh, Hanskas are fast, Gerants are big. Uh, <laughs> then there's Quantals who can use the path, and Marjols who can do this like shadow work. They might be called tribes. Magic. The four tribes. 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 Yeah, yeah I think you're right there, Charles. Mm-hmm. So then Hessa has Quantal blood, I guess is important for later stuff. And Nona has to protect Hessa to prove that she has these shield abilities and people basically is the first one a spear that gets thrown and then there's a, a throwing star yeah. and then an arrow yeah. and Nona basically stops all of these things in front of a big crowd. At short range also uh, yes. is one of the things. Yes. yes. And she does that using her Hunska powers basically of being really fast and in part what we later learn are marjol powers Mm -hmm. which are her blades that she has these invisible blades that are kind of like claws which is how she cut ramal taxis in the first place so anyway long story short with the ordeal nona is now believed to be the shield and we learn about some of these prophecies uh, prophecy things in depth charles what did you think of the prophecy stuff um it wasn't until we get to that conversation with abbas glass and nona where glass kind of reveals her hand mm-hmm. pun, pun intended to to nona <laughs> where where <laughs> where she's like look i don't believe in any of this prophecy mumbo jumbo but a lot of people do and it was important for me to gain sympathy in front of all of these super important people and it was just easier to like have the high priest come in and and try and use um, old laws to to get her killed to then revert that using the sympathy and the trials and you know, all that all that stuff. So Abbas class is basically like she's part of the prophecy. It's real. And then she burns her hand off. And then you know, Anona kind of takes some serious injuries, deflecting the the arrow. So Glass was like, yeah, I did all of that. So that was the means to an end and the means was removing the high priest from office yes and once i got to that portion it became a lot more interesting for me and it kind of re-solidifies mark lawrence's kind of whole philosophy of of Mm -hmm. fantasy right where not everything is kind of as it reads these kind of rational minds this like his scientific background right all these rational minds kind of prevail and technology and realism tends to kind of prevail in, in in his worlds and he was like yeah and glass was like yeah you know i just wanted to overthrow the high priest and this was how i could do it i have no problems using prophecies as tools if it's the gets to the means and there's that quote she mentions if you have it about where um she they go on and on about just the ends justify the means basically I don't have that quote. Uh, I assume it, it was during the conversation where Abbas is saying all this, like it's made up. And I n- know that the, she also says the Argatha never created it, but it was concocted decades later by other right. people. So it, what's interesting too about that is that others, even when they have all the same information as glass, still choose to believe it (laughs) and there's this moment wheel is the sister wheel is the most pious of any of these uh, folks and she kind of slots into that teacher who hates our main character uh, 
trope from these stories about schools and fantasy. And Nona says to her that the prophecy is made up. And Wheel says, that's what prophecy is. It's something that is made up and that we have faith is true. So I, I love this chosen one trope used by Lawrence. Like mm-hmm. Lawrence has us speculating on who is the chosen one between Ara, Nona, and eventually Zol, and all the while is telling us, hey, there is no chosen one. This whole thing is made up. And it plays with our expectations as fantasy readers, because part of us is like, well, even when people don't believe the chosen one is a thing, it kind of is in fantasy, yeah. but it's also Mark Lawrence, and he's saying <laughs> it's not real, so we're just taken for a ride with yeah. this. <laughs> I found the quote, and it and it happens before the trial, right? And Nona's reflecting on it as Glass is going to take the candle trial. Words are steps along a path. The important thing mm. is to get where you're going. And that's something right. that gets repeated a couple times. So kind of basically the ends justify the means. And that's was foreshadowing Abbas Glass's strategy, which was use the sympathy of her getting maimed and mm-hmm. these ideas of prophecy to overthrow, like the means. And even Nona had this conversation. She was trying to think it out. She was like, what was the means in all this? And then she was like, oh, you tried to get rid of the high priest. And she was like, yeah, exactly. That was what this was all about. <laughs> <laughs> so very interesting. Um, always fun to, to see that kind of, tropey subversion stuff getting thrown in and in a world like mark lawrence's it's so honest and and, yeah and well structured exactly and we do get the stage set here for abyss glass as this i don't know if i would quite say machiavellian but if then justifies the means that's the first mind (laughs) that comes up Uh, uh, so i'll say as this person who is very entrenched in politics and is making lots of moves to try to get what she thinks is best and it's (laughs) she did a lot to make this one and as a leader of a church too which you tend to think is like so bound in faith that they wouldn't necessarily be capable of these things like misusing prophecies for political gain and scheming and things like mm-hmm. that. So in a traditional sense, like in that world, it is very much like the world of politics and religion or, and, and military are all kind of blurred. But our conventional sense of what like a nunnery is and what religion is, yeah. it's kind of played upon here as well in this Abbas Glass character. She's not what you would consider like a pope or the head of a nun a nunnery to be like you know <laughs> yeah there's a good moment where they tell the abbess that they i think they tell her that they want her to be the new high priest or at least to be on this uh like council or whatever it is mm-hmm. and then she's like politicking isn't for me and they all start <laughs> laughing, cracking yeah. up <laughs> right. yeah i do remember that <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's pretty much the main stuff that happens in Red Class. We do get Nona and Ara taking their names of Cage and Thorn, respectively. And I know, Charles, you said you kind of forgot about uh, Thorn because there's so much other stuff happening. For For me, when I first read it, I thought that Nona would be Thorn. And I think that's probably what Mark Lawrence wants you to do is, okay, our main character is Nona. The interludes have this future person who is a sister, so she's probably Thorn. And then later on, we find out, no, Thorn's Ara, and Nona takes the name of Cage, which Mm -hmm. sets us right into this other interlude where we get to see that Sister Thorne is a total badass, first yes, off. Yeah. <laughs> she takes out tons of people coming at her. And then we find out that a spear comes at her, Hunska fast. Uh, we know Nona is a Hunska, but we also know some other characters, like <laughs> Clara, are Hunskas. And then someone whose name begins with a C <laughs> right, because, takes her down. Because like, Sister Thorne is like, she's like, doesn't have to be this way. Don't see. And then like, it just yeah. shows a C with an asterisk. And then so it's like, cut. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, it's either Clara or Cage. Yes. And I was already suspicious about Clara at this point anyway, because you get so many of these moments where Clara is making these like seemingly not 
that big of a deal, but really are a big deal gestures like, oh, hey, you know, you could sleep in my bed tonight if you if there's no other beds available. Or, oh, hey, we could go hang out and practice together or whatever. And then Nona's like, yeah, I think I'm going to go hang out with Arabella instead. And there were just a couple of those moments won into this plus constantly Claire is saying these troubling things of like mm-hmm. oh you know money makes the world go round and then she's getting she's spinning from a from a bronze from like a penny to a silver coin and you're at this point you're like okay so she's definitely something is going on with Claire here that I'm not 100% yeah. comfortable with so I was pretty suspicious on Clara but I was like it could be cage you know so I which would be very, very interesting. So who knows? <laughs> yeah. So that was a great use of just what Lawrence had at his disposal by making <laughs> Cage a name that starts with C and Clara. So it was really and very well done, interesting use of the and, book medium as well. <laughs> like C yeah. dash. You're like, <laughs> why does that? That well wouldn't done. work in movies. You'd have to like have a shadowy figure or something. <laughs> So and yeah, that's no, all said see, too, Charles. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it like wouldn't translate, but <laughs> very yeah. interesting. So uh, Charles, you're talking about Clara here and how these hints are dropped throughout, and I think Clara basically gets the opposite treatment of Ara here, where uh, she starts in the friend like let's say Ron or Hermione or Will from King Killer, and we can slot her in there. But then we start getting these hints that, wait, she might not be as undying, loyal, and uh, friendship-focused as <laughs> Nona is, or as these tropes we're used to filling Clara's spot is. And I think there's <laughs> there's great stuff Come, that comes up like Kettle says at one point to Nona a word to the wise the hardest lesson I ever learned was that every bad thing you see a friend do to someone else they will someday do to you yeah. some people in this world are users and some givers when two such form a bond it often ends poorly find more friends Nona Clara Gomel spends enough time thinking about herself without you to help her do it and <laughs> that's yeah. pretty early that's page 159 in my paperback here okay. so it's not like all this stuff comes out of nowhere. As you're saying, Charles, you do have every reason to be suspicious yeah. of Clara throughout, but it's almost the opposite of that Ara thing where like, what keeps us from being too suspicious sometimes is that we're like, but Clara's the friend. Yeah. <laughs> she plays the like Ron Weasley role. It's like Harry's not going to all of a sudden be buddy buddy with Draco and forget about Ron, yeah. you know, <laughs> which is yeah. kind of what's happening in, in this uh, version of how tr- the tropes are being used. Yeah, I got that. I, I always suspected her though. Like too many of those moments throughout the whole yeah. book for me to ever fully buy into the fact that she'll like in the 11th hour be truly the good friend and that someone else betrayed them you know but it was always possible and with this flash forward which again was another good use of bending time which i'd come into this as being very hesitant i actually really quite enjoyed that c dash so (laughs) yeah (laughs) good on you charles i was like okay you're loving it and also it gives a little more insight into like the dynamic that's being played in the red class right now has these huge effects as they grow into adults. So it's like, oh, what happens between their childhood and adulthood? What is this falling out moment that one is killing another one, you know? So all that was really good use of that flash forward and and, and time warping. And it, like you said at the beginning of this episode, it, it all comes down to the relationship dynamic of these characters that drives it. Exactly. And you did mention the asking Nona to come into bed with her and stuff. Yeah. I think that seems to be coming from like Clara uh, very obviously has like romantic feelings for Nona. For sure. I don't think that was necessarily a part of anything more elaborate than she that. She just had a crush on her, you know, so young yeah. love. And I mean, she's kind of being like, you can come here, you know? And this was like juxtap- like put up a right against the scene of two girls sharing a bed and like rubbing feet mm-hmm. and stuff in a very like sensual way or whatever, like just like yeah. a companion way. And um, it was very understated, but still like very obvious these two things were happening at the same time. And, and Nona was like pretty uncomfortable about it. And and then Ara was like, oh, there's an empty bed next to me. And she's like, see ya, pew! And like, mm-hmm. and, like leaves um, 
um, Clara alone. And after, you know, when you have a moment of you just became vulnerable and then you get rejected, that could kind of pile on to how you could eventually stab someone in in in, uh, in the future. <laughs> Yeah, or <laughs> prick them with a needle that has poison on it. Yes, so. or poison them for <laughs> sure. Yes. Um, what is it? Something? What is it? Hell have no fury like a lover scorned. What's that phrase? <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> and <laughs> we then move on to gray class, and we that's we've got Nona's aged up as are the rest. Age, Nona's more like twelve now, and we have. Shirzal, who's the emperor's sister, coming with Zol and Yisht, who are two ice tribers. And this uh, this sets a stage for a lot of what happens in the next half of this book, Charles. I see Uriah's getting. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Uriah loves this part of the book. He's getting, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She'll quiet down. And... Yeah, any thought? We get Zol and Nona fighting. Uh, Nona loses, but Ara walks the path. Nona gets whipped. Nona also walks the path in her own anger-fueled way. That's kind of what's happening during this trip. Anything to say on all this, Uh, Charles? Not so much. I just find it interesting that it was very much like a WWF ring with like the with the stanchions all along the outside of like the the like the um you know, the border that you can kind of bounce back from. And I was like, okay, interesting. And then we had like the, what is it called? The blade path back at the convent. Yeah. That's like basically like American Ninja Warrior kind of like <laughs> set up yeah. there. So I was like, okay, we're going from American Ninja Warrior to WWF. <laughs> Very exciting stuff going on. But for the most part, I thought this middle section of like all the training and the tournaments and stuff was the most kind of draggy portion of the whole thing. I was kind of ready to get more into the mystery and the character relationships than I was like, and then this battle and then that battle and then this battle. And I was like, okay, uh, let's, I was ready to move on, you know, back to the convent. That's fair, Charles. I did get some of that feeling myself when we were going through. So we go to the Caltus where there's, uh, there's that other instance with Raymol, which I think we kind of need, we need another Raymond interaction just because that Term- is the the through line through this whole thing. The way it ends, basically, besides the relationships, is that Nona does eventually get revenge on Raymond. So I think we do need that moment. Right. And it shows and- that there's something going on with him where he's cut yeah. and he doesn't bleed and he doesn't take damage like a normal yeah. person would. There's some ma- and we know that it took a lot of magic to keep him alive, so... It was good to see that kind of getting put in place for the ultimate face-off at the end where we see just how truly like unstoppable he is from this magic. So it does, you're right, sure. remind us of him, replant those seeds, all that good stuff. Definitely. So I think we needed it. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. She goes to the academy and she finds out that she's got Margil blood, that's what the blades are. So we find out that known as a three blood, and that's important for this because uh, the prophecy has this whole the four voices will speak at once bit going, and people think that means that a four blood is the chosen one. That's the the shtick of it. And we think, oh, maybe Nona is, she's got three, maybe she's got a fourth, but she's pretty small, so the Jaren thing seems unlikely. Um, yeah, then we end up with, after that interaction with Raymol, Nona might be poisoned, and she goes to try to steal ingredients to get a cure, she sees Yish doing some sketchy digging, and speculates that she might be trying to steal the ship hard, then, yeah, go to the academy, um, or that's where, that's where the Marjol stuff happened at the academy. Yeah, they plan yeah. to put Yisht in a barrel is <laughs> the next. But yeah, and I think like this is kind of the feel of the, these events. It's like, okay, now this thing's happening. Now that thing's happening. It does set the stage. Yeah, meanwhile, there's, there's all this training stuff, all the classes at the school and all yeah. this other stuff. And you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 okay. And she, they tried to put Yish in a barrel. <laughs> 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 and ship her away. With I like line. that. That's such like a you know ten year old 
yeah like kind of mentality. it's like we won't kill her we'll put her in a barrel <laughs> and ship her away i was like am i really reading this it's kind of fun <laughs> yeah it, it does feel true there's some innocence Sometimes, about that plan you know <laughs> yeah yeah uh, meanwhile clara is like just kill her but <laughs> the rest of them are still a little more innocent and they do put her in a barrel and they do ship her away and it sort of works right. it doesn't long term but uh you know that's what happens when you put a bunch of 12 year olds together <laughs> and have them come up with a plan yeah. <laughs> exactly. The fact that they were able to pull it off was um, fortunate enough for them. <laughs> so, it, yeah, I think that's pretty much that middle portion. Things start to get really picked up again when they go out on the ranging. And that's basically that they get dropped off somewhere and have to go to a particular destination. I can't believe and the nuns thought that was a good idea. They're like, okay, everyone out into the wilderness unprotected. <laughs> well, it's a long standing tradition that happens every year. And they do take precautions here to have very seasoned warriors guarding all the three most important people, which uh, story wise feel like it's. Uh, Typically, the most important people are known are and Clara, but in the actual plot, the most important people to the nunnery are Nona Ara and then uh, Zol, right. who is revealed to be a four blood at during this ranging. Kettle gets poisoned. Nona finds her, and Kettle's like, "Ah, the rest of you are di- are just distractions. Like the real." chosen one is Zol. Mm -hmm. that was an interesting little reveal um like i i feel like to get us to the ranging part was kind of a stretch like yeah okay like let's send them out ranging it's a tradition whatever but still i was like come on like i think the circumstances are a little bit different for for this troop but they tried to (laughs) bring some sisters to follow them but and what and that was a nice little reveal too it's like oh each of you had someone following you and then there was this whole thing of, you know, wh- back when, um, what's her name, Vasca, the the one that tried to steal the ship heart, Venka. Oh, Yish. Yish. Why do I think it was? I think you're naming a, a character from the Poppy War. Oh, <laughs> Venka. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Yish uh, was trying to steal the ship heart, and um, they were like, "We should just tell the abbess. We should just tell her." Which I was like, "Yeah, that's obviously the right thing to do." <laughs> but she was out of town, and so it's like, okay, well, at least. <laughs> That makes some sense. I go, so when they decided not to tell her, I was like, it kind of doesn't make sense. And then Nona was like, you know what? I should tell her. And I was like, okay, good. And then it's like, oh, she's out of town. I'm like, oh, that's smart, Lawrence. <laughs> like, good, <laughs> good idea to have her not be there for whatever reason. And maybe we'll learn more about what she's up to in future books. But for now, I thought it was a good way to kind of justify some more of the stuff that's going on because like the minute you realize yish is trying to steal the ship heart and they're all connected you probably wouldn't just immediately be like time to go ranging you know (laughs) so you probably kind of investigate and see what happens so that was kind of my qualms going into this but once we were there like the pacing of the book really took off and i really enjoyed reading all of these ranging moments i love again coming back to the setting i love this idea of this like ice corridor and like they just don't understand the technology of the lens and the sun and and they just know that it carves this one warm path into the glaciers that they live in very very cool so and that's also a pun um <laughs> ah, so uh cool as it yeah. cold. <laughs> oh charles you, <laughs> you guys got to keep up here and uh, yeah, yeah no so, so i really enjoyed their the ranging portion once we got off into it and um you put the you put all the relationships that all these classmates built and you put them out on their own against all the odds and you see how they handle it. And that's when the pacing really started to move for me. Yeah, I would agree. This, the ending I think of this book is really strong. I do love, they're going out on the, (laughs) they're going out to the ranging and Clara just starts like mumbling to herself and those around her about how, money makes the world go round and she's going to make something of herself. And everyone's like, what do you do? Like, why are you saying all this? And she's like, you don't know if you're going to come back. So you might as well say what you got to say. And it's more, it's like, okay, Clara, let's keep in mind is 
about 12 at this time, so maybe she's not the best at keeping her well, they might betrayal be, secret. I think they're gray class at this point, right? And that's a little yeah. older. They're like 14. I don't think so yet. I thought gray I class was like, like 13, 12, 14. 13. Maybe I'm what, wrong. Who cares? It's like a difference of a year. Either way. Yeah, of 13. Either way, teenage, <laughs> teenagers, yeah. early teenager, probably not going to be great at keeping secrets either. No. Um, so we are, <laughs> yeah, we're getting some hints pretty blatantly, and so is Nona, which is pretty important because we end up in this situation where they're all in a cave. Like our main characters are all in a cave. And the Taxis soldiers are surrounding this cave, and they want they want vengeance upon, or really, the Taxis in charge of them, Ramel. Mm-hmm. They want vengeance upon Nona in particular, but they tricked Clara into basically selling people out and then poking them with a poison that would disable everyone from fighting back. Right. Um. By telling her that they actually wanted Aura. And Clara, as we find out throughout this book, she has some negative feelings toward Aura. It's complicated for sure, Mm -hmm. but definitely doesn't value her friendship as much as she values Nona. And there's some sense here that maybe Clara wouldn't have done it if it was Nona, but maybe she would have. And Maybe, but, but Clara was like, you know, Nona's supposed to get away and Ara's the one that gets taken yeah. and that was the deal, you know? So she made the deal yeah. assuming that Nona would be safe. So yes. I'm of the belief that she just really didn't like Ara and still kind of wanted to make it work with Nona. So mm-hmm. I'm on board with that. And it seems like something okay. a 14-year-old would do because yeah. you know, she does kind of have a crush on Nona a little bit. And then also Ara comes from the nobility and Claire's family has had money sh- mm-hmm. problems. So I just think she hated pretty much everything about Ara from her wealth to her status to her seemingly yep. um, how she gained friendship with Nona. That's kind of putting a shadow over Claire's relationship with Nona. So... I kind of am of the belief that she kind of wants Nona all to herself a little bit at this point. And I've read through all this, so I'm also trying to be very careful (laughs) in my wording. I think if Charles is free to make more clear just speculations of what will happen in the future (laughs) than I am. So I'm always interested to hear that. It's, yeah, it's an interesting and well-built toward, I don't even really want to call it a twist, because in part what happens is Nona had this black cure prepared uh, and Nona, like us, has picked up on all of these signs from Clara, and she's like, something's not right here. Yeah. And Nona takes the black cure to prepare herself because she'd also smelt the like cat piss smell mm-hmm. on uh, Clara way back, which she knows is that, I think, boneless uh, poison. Yeah. So Nona's like, okay, I'm just going to take this thing and be ready if Clara's going to use that poison on me. And it ends up making Nona actually resistant to it and able to fight back in this moment. So uh, I think in that way, it's almost like not quite a twist. Right. I don't know how you'd describe it, 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 Charles. For me, I had suspected it from halfway through the book, so it wasn't so much a twist as it was this kind of revelation. It was presented like a twist, though, honestly. And then like all this stuff that we afterwards right after the twist is re- twist I, yeah air quotes is revealed the known is like oh yeah i suspected her this whole time it's like we didn't know you suspected her this whole time and the story is being told through your perspective like y- you weren't thinking about how she mysteriously took extra ingredients and the smell was suspicious and all this other stuff you're not telling us this until after the twist is revealed it's like i get it and that you didn't want to spoil that reveal but it also kind of felt like, yeah, okay, how would we have ever known that if you hadn't written it in, you know? So, and then like, oh, she takes it preemptively because she suspected her the whole time. It's like maybe weave more of that suspicion into it because she's so steadfast. Friends do everything for friends. And she had no problems with suspecting her enough to take this really deadly poison. Uh, so, well, Charles, let me. <laughs> I <weigh> think. <laughs> Well, my first part is I think I 90% agree with you. Okay. And that is that, yeah, with this tight a point of view to Nona, I would say that 
we should get more of this stuff beforehand rather than all of it kind of thrown at us right at the end. After and I think, the reveal, yeah. Yeah, after the reveal. And I also kind of think that if you're not suspecting Clara by this point, I don't want to say you're not paying attention, but there are a lot of op- for opportunities sure. to start for suspecting sure. Clara. For sure. So it's like, I don't know. I don't know if it needed to lean on that uh, twist. Like maybe we should have just gotten that information, like you're saying, Charles, up front, That's and that should I'm just saying. been a thing that played out. Um, as for Nona not trusting her friend, I think we also get the reveal that her first ever friend betrayed her basically and was there to try to turn her into someone mm-hmm. right that juggler so i think that that that's the 10 percent i'm not with Jan, which is i like that nona ends up actually not trusting her friend after yeah. all this time because of her past experience ultimately i'm super um excited by everything that happened i just felt like the experience was kind of lessened by giving us all this stuff that she had felt the whole time that we never knew immediately yeah. after the reveal. You know, like you said at the beginning, there's more than enough reasons to suspect Clara and the fact that Nona goes from friendship or like ride or die friendships to suspecting her to the point of taking this really deadly poison is an interesting one. And maybe I would have liked to have seen more of that struggle, like that decision to drink this really dangerous Mm -hmm. potion that everyone's like, Oh, I'd rather, I'd rather die than take that potion. Like to see her decide that just on the chance that Clara might betray her. That's an interesting moment that we really didn't get because of this attempt to save the reveal, which I, it felt kind of weird to me. It felt like I got a little behind the curtain into the writing process with those moments, whereas everything else had me kind of enraptured. That moment, I was like, and eh, it's kind of like justifying the twist. That's fair, Charles. So that's all I'm going to say about it. Yeah. I really liked it, though, and I would have liked to have seen that moment where Nona drinks the poison, you know, because it's like, man, mm-hmm. you have to really believe someone's going to poison you if you're going to take it. <laughs> yeah. That, and it does mess that's her up, true. right? She, her eyes get... Yeah, her eyes get completely black uh, after that. So just no no difference between pupil and otherwise. It's just yeah. black eyes at this point. So that's interesting. And I think it's very true to finishing off Clara's arc in Red Sister while leaving this room to... Uh, okay... Did she really want to betray Nona? Because Nona speculates on, hey, if they told her it was me, would the price have gone up or gone yeah, down right. for what Claire would be willing to take? But she doesn't even consider, would she have said no? <laughs> like, yeah. So Nona it, it disagrees with you, Charles, in <laughs> Red Sister, thinks that Clara would have betrayed her. It just might have changed the price. So, well, this was a betrayal, also. Yes. Getting poisoned in the first place is a huge For betrayal. Sure. Um, so, yeah. But different levels. Different of levels. To turn yeah, her over yeah. to the taxes. Uh, Ooh, would she temporarily... accept the price? Yeah. So I bet it would have to go up. Leaves, <laughs> I would think at least, yeah. And I think. It leaves room for what we get later, and we'll get to that last epilogue in the future where this obviously is more open-ended. So then we get this awesome showdown. Yeah. Oh Well, I actually, I should start with Nona tells her true story of why she got sold. That yeah. included the reveals and that Nona killed a bunch of people with her blades and all this stuff. And we also get then Yisht has returned because all you did was send her off yeah. in a barrel for a few <laughs> they days. They put Yisht in a barrel. <laughs> yes. And then Hessa tries to fight Yisht off. Nona, through their path connection, is able to witness this, which is an interesting use of POV, I think. And then Hessa dies. Nona cut away her shadow. <laughs> that doesn't have a ton of ramifications yeah. yet. <laughs> and then we end up from there the fight with Raymol and his troops. Mo- his troops is where it starts. 
Right. And I like this battle. You know, you slowly start to see more of like how he's indestructible. And I like the moment where all the, the girls come out of the cave with weapons yeah. and start like trying to hit him. And he's like, oh, and he like throws them all around. <laughs> that would have been a that's a great TV moment. I'd love to see yeah. that on the screen. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> this giant Stuff. juggernaut of a person fueled by like devil demons, I guess. And, yeah. and he got, can't be killed. And these girls are running up with these weapons weight that don't belong to them and, and start like trying to hack them up. <laughs> it's fun. It was great. Before that, we do get Nona using some path abilities mm-hmm. to take out a ton of soldiers and yes. lightning quick. So she's got these path and... Uh, kind of alarming her approach because you know the nuns constantly teach like patience Mm -hmm. serenity and she's like and even in the beginning of this book they say like fighting is about control you know that was a huge part of the beginning of the nuns training her and then she's all just like i can't do any of that this only works if i'm really mad just barreling forward like juggernaut style and um that's where she kind of finds her groove and is able to unleash all of this devastation (laughs) Yeah, and it is interesting with Nona where you get these these parts of her character fleshed out more where she's saying, yeah, at my core, I'm a monster. <laughs> like, if you heard my real story, which you will now, you'll see that I am just awful because that's how view- she views herself. We might disagree. Right. And she views herself that way as this person just pretending to be normal this whole time but deep down she just lusts for violence which raises some interesting questions almost along (laughs) the same lines of our what makes a monster conversation and along the lines of our poppy wars conversation we're like how much Mm. of these things are we proud of her for and how much of these are warning signs that we should be concerned about her you know because she is like tapping into just pure anger and using that to kill a lot of people so is that personal growth or is that something kind of alarming are we making a monster here <laughs> mm, you make some really good points there charles and i'll just refrain from getting too into that I but say, I, I know just coming have... off of poppy wars like anytime yeah. a character kind of pr- progresses through it just embracing violence like that's not a great thing it's great in terms of keeping you and your friends alive in this moment but it's kind of troubling if that's how you solve your problems <laughs> Yeah, well, Charles, to that point, there's a quote in on page 87 of my paperback where Nona says, or her internal monologue is, anger had its place and anger had its place. It was a weapon not to be neglected, but so did patience and Nona decided that control lay in deciding which to use and when. So, Charles, will Nona be able to maintain that control long term? Stay tuned. But right. And I think I highlighted something probably right after that where she's like, fighting is about control, control of your fear, your pain, and your anger, control of your mm-hmm. weapon and your opponent, blah, 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 blah. And that's, the, that's actually the lesson that she's hearing in like her first Blade class. So, uh, um, very interesting mm. stuff fighting is about control of your anger will that theme play out now that she just lets her anger get unleashed uh well are we going to learn more about controlling that or or just embracing it who knows mm. well said charles well we get this big fight with Raymond. all the we get Darla and <laughs> Jula and Ruli and then Ara all kind of unleashing everything they have on him yeah. to which works to various extents but not really <laughs> and then you know he's got this big red eye that gets revealed in the middle of the fight it was very cinematic as you were saying Charles right. I, I really enjoyed reading this part it was very visual in my head and eventually Nona is able to use that amulet thing and yeah. is able to kill Raymol, who's been screaming, like, I can't be killed. They won't let me. Yeah, they die, won't let me, which, which was a very <laughs> troubling thing to hear. <laughs> <laughs> that it was. But it was so much fun. I was like, they won't let you? Like, Im- <laughs> like maybe hinting that you kind of want to die? <laughs> yeah. So. so we get an idea of that maybe his life has gotten pretty tortured since the the mages brought him back from the brink of death. Mm-hmm. And... 
it makes even more sense why he wants vengeance upon Nona because not only did she just almost kill him and now he's fine, she almost killed him and now his life might be pretty torturous because he's possessed by all of these demons. Right. And that whole, they won't let me bit, like you said, Charles, it definitely sticks with you. <laughs> there was some weight to that line for sure. I really liked it. Yeah. So... W- we see the end of Ramel Taxis. Uh, we get the sense from what comes up next, the epilogue, that this is not the end of the feud <laughs> with <laughs> Nona and the Taxis family. So it's pretty interesting. We get what what Sister Cage or Nona has become, which is some sort of legendary feared person, I guess. Who sure these novices have heard rumors about and they're like oh they're all true she's that frightening and then people literally just run from her some of these soldiers will just run seeing nona and her lack of a shadow and her completely black eyes and then she comes up to clara who's standing over ara who's basically nearly bleeding out at this point but she's still alive and then they have a conversation basically about friendship, yeah. which is interesting right after Nona comes out, just this fearsome person and, and Clara. And uh, they switch back to their, you know, Nona and like yes. the name Nona comes back at these moments, you know, we've been in and out with Cage. So exactly. There's such a great exchange that I love here because we also get Nona, even if she suspected that her friend was going to betray her, she did not, do anything to harm Clara after that because friendship does mean so much to Nona. Right, and she and doesn't she doesn't buy in that Clara's like unredeemable at yeah. this point, even though she basically skewered Ara. <laughs> it's like, okay, you still want to give her a chance? All right, good on you. Yeah, and there's this great exchange where Clara says, we were children, Nona. Children make and break friendships all the time. It's not important. This, what we're doing now, this is important. It's about sides in the great game that's being played, and you're on the wrong one, the losing one. You should change sides. Nona shook her head. I'm not playing, and I've always been on your side, Clara. You've just not properly understood it. (laughs) And isn't that kind of at the core of, we say this book's about relationships, that exchange there, Clara and Nona, where Clara still wants to be friends or be on the same side with Nona. Like, Clara seems to really value Nona in some way, even if she was willing to make that betrayal. And Nona says, look, like I don't care about anything bigger than that. I've always been on your team here, Clara, and you just don't seem to get it. And I, I just love that exchange, Charles. Me too. I love that flash forward. And I think that's what has me so excited for Grey Sister is this idea of these relationships and how did we get here? And, you know, like the flash forward does such a good service to their relationship because like I've always been on your side. You never know. And it's like you're on the losing side. Of this. So like there's this greater conflict that we still get mm-hmm. to understand. And there's all this it's rooted in these like almost innocent esque childhood friendships that have gone on to go through the ringer that is adulthood and this really harsh setting that Lawrence created. And I'm just really excited to see where it goes. Brilliant use of the flash forward and brilliant use of the school setting to create these really awesome relationships. And brilliant book, Charles, when I've been, when I've been reading this, I think I vaguely remembered that I must have really loved this book, but I think I forgot how much I love this book because <laughs> I, I don't know. I was enraptured. It's like so, so good. This might rank up higher among my favorite fantasy novels than I remembered. So I'm really, really enjoying this. Me too. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm looking at the release schedule. We might have to take a break from Book of the Ancestor to get in um poppy war but we'll we'll finish poppy war and then we'll come back with book of the ancestor and i'm very excited about that for sure charles and 
this is something for us to work out off the air, but there's a short story called Bound that's in between books two and three that's only like 40 some odd pages. Mm. So maybe we won't have to take that break after all. We'll, between we'll books two and this. three. Okay. Yeah, like maybe we'll release Bound. I don't want to make any promises for our listeners, but let's talk about if we can read <laughs> through Bound and try to release that as well so the the Buddy Read continues. So we're all right. The Buddy Read continues. And um, yeah, anything else before we bring it home? Nah, just pumped here, Charles. I'm I'm loving this. I'm loving this too. It's good to be back. It's been years since I've read Mark Lawrence and... Um, I'm, I didn't realize how much I missed him until now. <laughs> so uh, let's get some music going. Thank you, everyone, for listening to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. This has been your co-hosts and lifelong friends, Charles and Dylan. If you like what you heard today, go ahead, find us on Apple Podcasts and Toss five stars to our podcast, guys. We also are available wherever else you can download podcasts for the most part. All the popular ones, anyway. Uh, Go ahead. If you know how to listen to us, you made it to the end of the episode. Uh, So (laughs) go ahead and find us on social media. Just Google Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. We come right up. Find us Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. You don't even have to write podcast, I think. Yes. Friends Talking Fantasy. You know we got that SEO on fleek. And uh, go ahead and uh, <laughs> drop us some comments, drop us some reviews, send us an email, the FTF podcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you think of all these stories, these conversations, these episodes. We'd love to hear from you. Or something else you want us to cover, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Let us know. What do send you want to see? Like yeah, send us stuff. Let us know what you want to hear. We'll bring it to you, the fan, because we love you guys. And, um, yeah, just always appreciate the thoughts. So, um, as always, everyone, go forth and conquer, friends.